Welcome to Storytellers, Indigenous Life in the Northwest. I'm Elizabeth Din. And I'm Jeff Giannolo. We're at the Oregon Historical Center in downtown Portland, where you can get a small glimpse of Native American history. But Native American life is thriving all around us, from farmers to engineers and artists to journalists. We're here to tell the stories of the past, present, and future. I call it my time machine because it takes you back to a time when things were a little, a little simpler. Uh, we all looked out for each other. We all took care of each other. So when you get in the canoe, uh, we're always constantly seeing, checking in on one another, seeing how we're doing. There, there was no need for them after we got brought to the reservation because there was, there was, the waters were only little creeks, little streams. So we didn't know anything about our canoes or what, we, there was no need for them. Knowing that where my, 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 my people come from, the mouth of the Columbia River, one of my great grandmas come from there. Uh, and so knowing that, uh, someone had to be in a canoe at some point. That was our way of life. All these memories, those feelings come back, you know, when you're in the canoe uh, from the last time you were on journey or, or whenever you're out on a waterway, uh, you start to wonder what, what they did here. You know, what, what foods did they eat here? Uh, when we start taking our canoes out uh, on our local rivers, uh, it made me see the landscape a whole different way because uh, you're seeing it from the river now. And now you're looking at it like, oh, this would be a beautiful place for a village. Well, guess what? That was actually a village site. And so it was really cool to land at a place and have that feeling of this is a good spot. It is a ceremony just getting in them, you know? And so just having them and bringing them to life, they have a heart, they have a name, they have that spirit of the wood, uh, they're alive. And my daughter's canoe out here that I made, that I gave her, when I was carving the nose, a blue jay landed on the tail of it, and it reminded me of my grandma, because with blue jays all out there, and so I was like, ah, oh, blue jay. And so I painted it blue, uh, just to re remind me of the blue jay and grandma, and so I tell my daughter that story of, of grandma and the blue jays, and so uh, just, just keeping grandma alive. I'm just, I'm really grateful that I'm keeping it alive for my kids and nephews and everybody. So. up later, we'll visit Brian in his workshop to learn more about the different carving styles. And while Brian is using his art to connect with his past, well, the new Dean of Engineering at Portland State University is using his heritage to fold indigenous ways into engineering solutions. I was interested in Dean physicians, but I was primarily only interested in uh, physicians where I felt like I could really make a difference in terms of Native community. And then this position opened up and it all worked out. <laughs> so my tribes, we're Lenape or Delaware Tribe of Indians is our federally recognized name. And then we're relocated to, to Oklahoma like a lot of other tribes. There are a lot of states back east where historically there were a ton of Native folks, but now there are no federally recognized tribes that are headquartered in those states, which is kind of remarkable, um, you know, whereas here it's quite different. And I think in a place like Portland and Oregon, that's clear to folks that we are still here. You know, you can go just about anywhere in the state and you see Native folks. First I'll say this is one of the, as far as I can tell, one of a few places where this type of work is you know, has sort of the critical mass of all the pieces that are needed to really move it, it forward. Uh, I think we've, you know, PSU historically, I think, done a lot. I think there's a lot more we can do and a lot that we can do better. So the way I think about it is that Native folks have so much traditional knowledge that is really relevant to, to the STEM disciplines. You know, so if you think about things, um, well, I'll throw an example from my time in New Orleans. So, so you, you know, when I was there, I, I spent a lot of time connecting with local tribes and things. And uh, before New Orleans was known as New Orleans, it was known as Bulbancha, which was place of other tongues in Choctaw because it was where people would go to trade. And I was at something and someone from one of the local tribes is like, you know, before the Europeans showed up. We came here, but we didn't live here year round. And it was because we knew about hurricanes and flooding and all of those things. And then the Europeans showed up and they built a city there. So that's kind of a simple example, but same thing could be said for, you know, things like knowledge around uh, wildfires, around fisheries management, around uh, 
you know, plants and foods. So I spent so our first year meeting with folks that most of the nine tribes in Oregon have uh, education departments and, and directors of education departments. They've been very gracious to meet with me and talk about their concerns and needs. Also, the types of jobs that we do in STEM are things that are really relevant to Native communities. So I think there's a good reason to do those. And if you think about engineering solutions to big problems, having diverse teams is really important to get them to those solutions. So it's, you know, really trying to involve Native folks and center Native knowledge and the assets that Native folks bring, but it's also things that benefit everybody if we have these diverse teams and, and you know, folks work together. Yeah, I do see myself and the students at Portland State, that many of them are first gen college students uh, who are sort of figuring out their, their way, who um, you know, get a lot of value from the experience here. So excited to, to meet people and get to know them and to, to think about how to, to help them have their, the best experience they can here. I would add to that, you know, it's not enough to just recruit people, but they have to be successful and we have to support them and the support structures we build are things we should be doing anyway and things that benefit everybody. So I, I really view it as a win for everyone, even though I, I do think the, the Native aspect is really important to me, both personally and professionally. PSU is also home to the Native American Student and Community Center, but it's also a reoccurring site of the Portland Indigenous Marketplace. And that pop-up market is specifically for Indigenous and Black artists and vendors. I'm Roberta with the Women's Wellness Garden, and uh, I'm Ogallala Lakota, Yomba Shoshone, and I'm enrolled in the Lower Rural Sioux Tribe. I'm a farmer for five years, and I do medicinal herbs, tea blends, native heritage foods, um, really food sovereignty work and land stewardship. And so we're here at the Indigenous Marketplace, and this is my booth. My name's Maria, Maria Gudinas. My native name is Omnawai Ayat, which means kind woman. Um, that name was given to me by my mother, Lolita Greeley. We are from the Columbia River. Um, our tribe is located on the Warren Springs Reservation. I've been doing beadwork since I was about six years old. I'm Natalie Mitchell, and I'm an enrolled member of the Citizen Potawatomi Nation, which is originally from the Great Lakes area, uh, Midwest, so Chicago was our land. and. Um, we were forcibly moved off that land and like a lot of other tribes and nations settled into Oklahoma. So my dad and my grandparents, they're all from Oklahoma, but I settled out here with my family in the 80s, so I'm very much Pacific Northwest girl. So I started beading um, about 30 years ago um, as a teenager, uh, self-taught. Um, there was, because of a lot of the, the forced removal and, and prejudice and racism, like practicing culture didn't happen, particularly in, in my tribe and in my family, especially as we got further away from Oklahoma. Um, and in the 80s and 90s, there just wasn't a lot taught to us. So I had to do a lot of self-education in learning about like our culture, our tribe, our history. Um, and so bead work was one of those uh, things that I had to do, I had to teach myself. Um, there weren't a lot of marketplaces like this when I was growing up, so I love that the children that are at these markets now will only know a time when you could go shop indigenous. So um, all of this stuff that's, that is here today is items that you could wear um, in an office setting or casual wear. Uh, it is uh, items that are worn, regalia that is used for powwows or even for ceremonial events. Um, these are, these are, and I like to show these because they're the color orange for Every Child Matters. Um, but these are baby moccasins and they're made with wool. Moccasins are made with uh, buckskin, which could be deer, elk, or buffalo hide. These are made with wool. Uh, we wear these today and, and for ceremonial purposes, they're worn for powwows. Um, some people you might even see just wearing them. Um, really proud of our breastfeeding tea here. Uh, it's called a Galactagog. It has hops and, and um, marigold and marshmallow and oat straw, so that helps 
a woman produce milk for her baby. And so that's what we're about. I'm a birth worker and an earth worker. This necklace set here is made with bone, crystal, and then dentalium. Hair ties. This is made with mother of pearl and deer skin. Usually these are worn on the hair or uh, on the fur ties, either on top or on the bottom. My style um, is very unique. Um, I just make up my own patterns and my own, you know, color palettes. Whenever somebody finally decides on a nice pair, I always hold the earrings and uh, I'll tell them, you know, oh, you know, I remember when I made those or, you know, what I was doing. Um, and then I always say goodbye to my earrings because, um, you know, they're, they're a part of me, you know, forever how long it took me to make them whatever thoughts I was thinking or conversations I was having, they were a part of me and I put myself into them and I always say goodbye because now they're gonna go off into the world and who knows how many people those one pair of earrings will meet. I bring fresh herbs so people can see what they look like, they can taste it, smell it, you know, and become familiar with it. Uh, and then they know that that's what's in the herbs. So I actually do grow this stuff. I don't buy any products and put them in there. And in the springtime, I'll bring the plant starts and then people can put those plant starts and start their own medicine garden. So I want to work myself out of a job. <laughs> a lot of folks are, they're very intentional with their dollars. Like they want to know like, um, are you indigenous? Did you make this? You know, where are you from? It's not this cultural or representation from the way, way back and the way, way past. It's like, no, we're, we're right here. We're right now. We're making things. We're making modern things. Um, not everything is in the past to be put up in a museum. You can actually participate in indigenous culture right now. You'll find indigenous marketplace pop-ups all around Portland throughout the year. Head over to coin.com to find an upcoming event. When we come back, we're gonna revisit Brian Crable's workshop and dig deeper into his work as a tribal artist carving canoes and paddles. Around 2004, my brother was invited to go on canoe journey with a family, and so uh, they came back with all this good stuff about how wonderful it was. And so in 2005, they approached our tribal council and they got us a canoe, and then we took it on canoe journey, and we're out on the bay there at Puget Sound. And it was Suquamish we pulled up to, and here's the whole beach is moving and we look back and there was like a hundred and some canoes with us at the same time as we're traveling and this glow this feeling of we're here we're somebody you're waking up something inside that's been asleep for a while this was our transportation your everyday life was in, in a canoe if you're by a waterway like the columbia river uh, or even the willamette this little bit of what i've taken away in my lifetime hopefully my kids will be able to pick it up that's all you can pray for is that uh, they pick it up and take it further than you did. I want to make them so good and the people that take care of them will love them and take care of them too because like I said they're, they're a piece of our, they're like your family once you have them. I learned how to make paddles, canoes came after I made the paddles. Each canoe takes roughly about 400 hours to make. Uh, most of my paddles here are out of Port Orford cedar. Really strong, durable wood, and you could carve them wicked thin. They'll hold up to just about anything. Right now, I'm putting this spine down the center of my paddles. Traditionally, this would just been flat, but because I like the Tillamook style paddle and because of how it performs, putting that spine down it is like putting a spine down your back. The stronger the spine, the stronger your paddle. So learning that, I could make the rest of the paddle really light. So most of my paddles now, I put a spine down them. And so that's why I'll put this line down the center of them. I got, I, I have this blade about as thin as I want to take it for now until I finish putting my spine down it. 
And then once, once I get my spine down it, what I'll do, just to protect it a little more, I'll come in here, try not to take away from that line. Some people have asked me to sit here and texture it and make all these marks down it like this. Uh, and they look like a raindrops. And they have a different texture on it. And I've done that during the whole paddle. It's fun, it's just, just uh, yeah, it just takes a little bit of time. When you hold up the paddle that you've handmade and other people really appreciate it, like I've had people get in my canoe and paddle with some of my paddles that I've made. They're like, man, why is your paddle so light? Oh, I love this thing, you know, and, I, and they'll feel it. And then the kids, uh, we went down to canoe races and the kids won the canoe race and they said it was because of the paddles. I was like, oh, that's cool, man, that's a good time. You give them a good paddle and then that gives them a good feeling and then they put their heart into it, put their back into it. They, they won that race because they won that race, but the, it does help to have a good paddle. Learning how to read the wood, knowing where the wood's from, knowing the shape, what it's supposed to be like, what it's supposed to perform like, because that paddle and that relationship that the paddle has with the water and the canoe uh, all coming together. So these paddles, you can see all the wear on these ones uh, are ones that I've made over the handful of years. Depending on where you set in the canoe, uh, different lengths of them. Um, you could see the, very, the different styles. This one's a Tillamook style. You could see the point is a little different from that one. Well, this one's a little cleaner. Uh, you could see this one's a little more rounded off uh, going by our, that's like uh, more of the bay by, uh, the lower Umqua, and then uh, like Reedsport area, somewhere in there, uh, all the way to Coos Bay, uh, down in the bays there. Um, and then this one being our Tillamook style uh, paddle, uh, straight from Tillamook, uh, haven't seen it nowhere else. This is kind of what my paddle blanks will look like after I cut them out in the shape. They're really thick, they're, uh, they're basically like a two by six, and, and if you could find the, the grain, the orientation of the grain going just right, where it's going all straight down the, from one end to the other so they don't break, uh, that's what you want for the strongest paddle is you don't want no crookedness in, in this area right here by your, by, by your handle. The shape of like this style paddle, I will come in here with this knife and all of these paddles right here that I'm making, uh, will will be taken down will be taken down to a point. I know a little more about th this particular paddle because this is more, more of where my family comes from uh, and where these canoe shapes come from. Um, and you could pop uh, the the wapato. Uh, you can cut cattail with them. Um, just a little bit. You can catch the the roots on the side of the river. Um, uh, you can catch the the the, like from the cottonwoods, uh, what grow out on the river so you can stop yourself and hold yourself off. All of our old paddles, all of them are made out of ash. When I was getting taught how to make paddles, Port Orford cedar was brought up and just carving them. They're wicked light. And when you're on the water for seven or eight hours, sometimes nine hours paddling and making this motion, uh, even the lightest thing is going to be heavy. Uh, so, so if you can make your paddle the lightest you can, um, and it still be wicked strong, which the Port Orford Cedar has been just that, I could still get a good flex. I could still get a good flex out of the blade. So you're supposed to be able to flex the blade like that. You can see it flexing a little bit. Uh, and that's so when you dig really hard, it kind of gives you a little fling. It's really, uh, Meditating too when you when you just grab a paddle and you start working on one. Every paddle, it's like the canoes too. You put that love in it. That, that's Grandma's special recipe. You can have all. The, that's the one ingredient I should say. Grandma's secret ingredient to anything she makes. Is that love that she has for you. So Brian offers tours, training, demonstrations, tribal consultations. To learn more, 
go to coin.com. And when we come back, come along as we take you inside a nonprofit newsroom that exclusively covers indigenous people here in the Northwest. Welcome back to Storytellers, Indigenous Life in the Northwest. And storytelling is such an integral part of Native American culture. Well, now there's a new group of storytellers in Portland, and they're dedicated to telling the stories of Native American communities in Oregon and Washington. We want to introduce you to the journalists at Underscore. Wahe Pinitai, Nina Haven, Nanisa Thainakia, Nenana Aninin, Nahasihana Jarrett Wirt. Hello, my relatives. Uh, it is good to see you. My Aani, our white clay name, is Thainakya, and my English name is Jarrett Work. And I'm a reporter and photographer with Underscore News and Report for America. At Underscore, we, um, we're a nonprofit newsroom that was started in 2019 um, here, here in Portland. And we exclusively cover indigenous communities and issues in the Pacific Northwest. We're a majority indigenous organization, both our board and our staff. I'm Casey Perlman, and I am the treasurer of the board for Underscore. I am Inupiaq, is my tribal heritage. I am originally from Los Angeles, California. I grew up in Southern California and then moved up to Portland about 20 years ago. I've been with Underscore since June of 2022. I two weeks after I graduated college. I'm originally from the Fort Belknap Indian community in Fort Belknap, Montana. You know, we're horse people, and buffalo people, and everyone out here is fish people, they're salmon people, so <laughs> trying to develop a taste for salmon is something that I'm, I'm trying to do. <laughs> I think the power of Native people to kind of be in charge of their own story is, is the beauty of working at Underscore. It's just awesome to be able to, you know, come into, a, come into this community and just help just share everything that's going on, the good, the bad, and the ugly. I know uh, a story I really loved, and Jarrett can tell you more about it, because he, he wrote it and photographed it. Um, it's, it was a profile on Koo Stevens, who now is a freshman distance runner at, um, at University of Oregon. Jarrett started tracking his, his story when he was a high school runner in Nevada. The story about Koo Stevens is definitely one of my, my most favorites. I've been following him for a couple of years now. The way I look at it is more of like a healing journey, um, retracing the footsteps that his grandfather took when he escaped from the Stewart Indian Boarding School in Carson City, Nevada, back to the Urington Reservation, which is about 50 miles. And his great-grandfather escaped the school three different times as an eight-year-old, mainly traveling at night. And um, after the third time that he escaped, the, the Indian agents were just like, you know, we're just going to leave him there. It's too much of a hassle trying to, um, to pick him up and bring him back. So seeing that Ku's great-grandfather used his legs to run for survival, and then Ku's using his legs now to run to remember and bring awareness of the experiences that people had at the Indian residential boarding schools who was able to achieve his dreams of running at the elite level at University of Oregon and becoming a duck. That's his dream since he was a little kid. I think that's the real beauty of the kind of reporting that's happening here, is it's, is it's helping shed a light on one person's situation, but it's also kind of a tide that's, that's lifting all the ships for, for really indigenous people all across the states and probably the world. We really do want to become, you know, have a paper of record for it indigenous communities in Oregon and Washington. We would really like to be where um, people know to turn, not just for you know, hard-hitting accountability or investigative reporting, but profiles on you know, community members, athletes, um, you know, activists, business owners. Getting to work for Underscore and serve as a, as a reporter and photographer is, is the best job that I could ever have. I, I love what I do. I love that I get to come into work every day and just learn, learn from everybody that we're talking to um, and, you know, tell those good human-centered stories. And I feel like um, that's what really sets Underscore apart is we, we're a small team and we really care about what we're doing and we're trying to really build that trust within the community and uh, do a good job. We invite you to check out the amazing reporting that Underscore is doing and also consider making a donation to support their great work. 
Just go to coin.com. There you'll find a link to their website along with much more information about all of the people we've featured today. And thank you for joining us for Storytellers, Indigenous Life in the Northwest. <laughs>